Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to look at how we measure development. So let's start with what is development? Development is a process of improvement in the material conditions of people through the diffusion of knowledge and technology. So development is improvement or advancement that countries undergo through the diffusion of knowledge and technology. And when did we see that knowledge and technology take off and countries really begin to improve? During and immediately after the Industrial Revolution. Development can be measured through both economic advances like creating new jobs and improving incomes, as well as through social changes like improving health and education. All countries began as less developed countries or LDCs, which is a country that is at a relatively early stage in the process of economic development. As countries make improvements, they move toward being a more developed country, or MDC, which is a country that has progressed relatively far along a continuum of development. And notice that it says it is a continuum. It's not just two boxes, more and less. It's a spectrum, it's a line, a continuum, and all countries fall somewhere on that line. But more developed and less developed isn't particularly accurate when many countries are found somewhere in the middle. So there is a theory that we will introduce tonight and then dive into a lot more detail on later in the year. The theory is known as the World Systems Theory, created by Emanuel Wallerstein, and provides an explanation for how countries got to their stages of economic development. But we will focus on the classification system introduced by Wallerstein. He divided the world into three classes, the core, semi-periphery, and periphery. The core countries were the more developed countries, the wealthiest with higher education levels and more advanced technology. They have more stable governments and were the most interconnected in the global economy. The periphery were the least developed. These countries lacked wealth and tended to have lower education levels. These countries were less stable, lacked necessary health services, and were less well integrated in the global economy. The semi-periphery has characteristics of both the core and the periphery. So if we remember our continuum, the core countries were on the more developed side. The periphery were on the less developed side and the semi-periphery countries were somewhere in the middle. So we now have three categories to evaluate the level of economic development for a country. So let's take a look at some examples. Let's start by practicing some content from Unit 1. What type of map are we looking at? Well, this is a choropleth map more specifically a categorical map. What is the scale of analysis? Well, it's at the national scale. And another question that we will often ask is if this, the world systems theory, is a good indicator of development. In other words, we're asking, is there a clear divide between countries that are more developed and countries that are less. Are MDCs or core countries in a separate core pleth class than semi-periphery or periphery countries? 
So we're asking, is the world systems theory a good indicator of development? Yes, it is. Because it divides the world into three categories, core, semi-periphery, and periphery, using levels of economic development to draw those distinctions. Take a moment. What do you notice about this map? What are some observations you have? What are some questions that pop into your head? Let's jot those down. Economic sectors have a strong correlation with economic development and are often spatially divided into core, semi-periphery, and periphery countries. So let's start out with what are economic sectors. Economic sectors are divided up based on how closely people work with natural resources. The primary sector is the portion of the economy concerned with the direct extraction of materials from Earth's surface, generally through agriculture, although sometimes by mining, fishing, and forestry. And notice we get several examples from this definition of primary sector activities. Farming, fishing, mining, forestry. And we tend to see a higher percentage of primary sector employment in countries that are less developed, especially periphery countries. The secondary sector is the portion of the economy concerned with manufacturing useful products through processing, transforming, and assembling raw materials. The secondary sector takes the raw material and processes them into something more valuable and usable. A lot of manufacturing takes place in semi-periphery countries. Think about the t-shirt you're wearing right now. The raw cotton was likely harvested in a different location than where it was manufactured into a more usable form, your t-shirt. But manufacturing is tricky because many core countries manufacture high-end goods like computers, microchips, automobiles, and other electronics. The tertiary sector is the portion of the economy concerned with transportation, communications, and utilities, sometimes extended to the provision of all goods and services to people in exchange for payment. The tertiary sector tends to be more associated with more developed countries, especially core countries. People often have a special set of skills or knowledge that allow them to specialize in the service that they provide. Let's look at a couple of specific countries. Today, in the United States and other developed countries, the primary sector usually employs less than 5% of the labor force. In a less developed country like Ethiopia, the figure is over 70%. The secondary sector isn't typically a good indicator because, as we mentioned, MDCs, or developed countries, will manufacture goods that require a large, skilled labor force, like electronics. While well, LDCs, or developing countries, will manufacture goods that require a large, low-wage labor pool, producing goods like clothing or textiles. In developed countries, like the United States, where manufacturing is on the decline, the tertiary sector is expanding and dominating the labor force. Since manufacturing is on the decline in many core countries, we describe them as post-industrial economies. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, every country was classified as pre-industrial. But as they industrialized, as knowledge and technology diffused to them, they began to shift to the secondary sector. And the quality of life in those countries began to improve. 
But now those manufacturing jobs are moving to go to other countries, often with lower wages, and core countries like the United States, Canada, Japan, and most countries in Europe become classified as post-industrial, where the tertiary sector is most dominant. And because so many development measures correlate with each other, development experts question whether improving one aspect, like education levels, leads to improving conditions among other markers for development. And that is a big question throughout a lot of our statistical analysis. Correlation or causation? Are two pieces of data related? Are they correlated? Or does one cause the other? Causation. So a Pakistani economist created and the United Nations or the UN adopted a metric of development that was based more on human welfare rather than exclusively economics. This is known as the Human Development Index or HDI. The HDI is an indicator of level of development for each country constructed by the United Nations combining income, education, and life expectancy. While sectors of the economy are good economic indicators, the HDI includes both economic and social indicators. It looks at a country's gross national income per person or what we will call GNI per capita. It looks at their life expectancy, as well as two separate education indicators. Those are the expected years of schooling at the start of a child's education, and the average years of schooling completed by age 25. The Human Development Index is a great indicator of development. So let's look at how it evaluates countries' levels of improvement, how advanced they are. We'll start again by asking, what type of map are we looking at here? What is the scale of analysis? And is the Human Development Index a good indicator of development? Again, we mean by that, is there a clear divide between MDCs and LDCs when you look at this data. Can you see divisions between the core, semi-periphery, and the periphery? Hopefully, you recognize that this is a core pleth map with data organized at the national scale and that yes, it is a good indicator of development. There is a clear divide between countries that are more developed and countries that are less. And to conclude our notes tonight, I want you to write down some more observations that you have, some more questions that pop into your head. And we're gonna bring those to class tomorrow so we can have a lively discussion about measures of development. I'll see you then. Have a good night, everyone.